Denmark, small, successful, and perhaps the country Scotland most seeks to emulate, leading the green transition with the world's second most livable city, the most contented workforce, and Europe's shortest working hours. But its people pay some of the highest personal taxes. So what makes the Danes so happy? A lot of people ask, is their model, can we scale this? And this is, mm, I don't think so. And go. I pay about 37% uh, of my income in taxes. If you don't pay that much in tax, you're not able to uh, have this welfare state. And then, so you see, it's all interconnected. We're not allowed to do exams, exactly. And we're not allowed to give grades. So that is a very unique uh, possibility for us to teach in a way that nobody is controlling how we do it. Copenhagen, the world's most sustainable capital. But like everything in Denmark, that happened not by accident, but by design. In the 1980s, the city was close to bankruptcy, with heavy industry in decline, a falling population, falling tax income, and a dirty, polluted river. The challenge was to bring young families back. So the council asked how, and got a surprising reply. Swimming right here in the centre of the city. And uh, as luck would have it, um, my colleague Tina Sobby is here. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> you are here, right in the water. I know. <laughs> How astonishing that we are here together. <laughs> so tell me, you were the city architect here for 10 years and helped, well, saw a lot of changes. When did they start swimming here in the harbour? It began around the year 2000, 2002. We had the first swimming bath. I guess it was in 2000. And just how much did you have to clean the water? Because it must have been horrible. <laughs> Quite a lot. So there was a lot of pipes that was going directly into the water and we needed to, to change them. That's putting it mildly. A new sewage system was installed with a runoff to make sure rainwater didn't cause overflows and the harbour sediment was cleaned. It cost hundreds of millions of pounds 40 years ago but it was worth it. The harbour was splitting the city in two. Nobody was coming down to the harbour because it was an industrial area and it was dark and it was gated and yeah, so it was not it was not a place you came. And today the harbour you can see is almost binding together uh, the Copenhagen. Elsewhere, a newly restored waterfront would be full of upmarket flats and private piers, but not here with planners determined to protect public access. We have a planning system where we have been putting uh, some guidelines and regulation so all the area is with public access. So a lot of the land is privately owned but, you, but it is with public access and I guess um, the solution that people can walk and bike along the harbour is also one of the reasons that we want to go here. Have you managed to keep the population in? Have you got more families that are living and not going off to a smaller suburb? When you just look around here, there is young people, that is, there is families, kids, uh, babies, and there is also uh, old people. So I guess we have quite a, a good population here where every generation is, is living in, in the city. But the 80s restoration didn't stop at the river. Housing was improved, and instead of glorified bin parks in back tenements, Copenhageners got lovely designed gardens with rules to guarantee cooperation. You should uh, make it into uh, one community, so you're not allowed to put any fence to privatize it. It should be the rainwater should have its own system, so you were uh, off uh, the big system. There should be no cars, so in a way you can also say it was and early thinking of sustainability. And then the important thing was also that we should maintain it ourselves afterwards. So it was also a democratic way of, of taking care of it. So, so now there is uh, money from every 
uh, family living here uh, into the maintenance. So there is a, a community maintenance, you can say. A third of homes in Copenhagen are cooperatively owned, and that's helped cap prices. Housing costs are slowly rising, but heating remains relatively cheap. The city's had district heating for a hundred years, and 98% of homes today get high efficiency, low cost heat from 10 central boiler plants. No struggling with individual boilers here. Only the Danes could imagine and build a heating plant like this. The Amerbaki plant, nicknamed Copen Hill, has an artificial ski slope on the roof. The energy comes from incinerating local rubbish, and that means minimal transport. The only emissions are water vapour, but the city aims to switch to biomass by 2025. Another design feature that keeps Copenhageners happy is travel. Bikes outnumber cars. Today, 58% of residents travel to work and school by bike using 500 kilometres of bike lanes and car-free bridges. This is one of the great bits of infrastructure that makes cycling the fastest way to get around Copenhagen and the safest, because it's a cycle and uh, pedestrian-only bridge. It's what makes cycling popular because it's fast, it's quick. I'm joined by Marianne Weinrich, who chairs the cycling embassy of Denmark. No anguish stressed expressions on cyclist faces here, generally, no helmets. In fact, people don't look like conventional cyclists at all. It's striking to see women like you, you're beautifully dressed. <laughs> yeah, you know, change into work, you know, cycling gear to get no. messy or mucky. No, we, we don't dress for the ride, we dress for the destination. Right. Amazingly, in the 1980s, Copenhagen was as car-centred, congested and cycle-unfriendly as many Scottish cities today. But there's been a lot of work to turn that around. We've come to Norapur station in the city centre, redeveloped with a huge bike park. It's big, but already not big enough. Politicians have chosen every year to have budget and investments and build more and more uh, cycle lanes. So it is kind of because it, the people also want it and we have uh, visionary politicians who, you know, makes decisions about this and, and sees this as part of mobility in Copenhagen. You're so relaxed here about cycling because you've built in the safety through the design of the Copenhagen lanes. Safety is part of the design. It's not necessarily something you wear. Um, and protected bike lanes is kind of the, the Copenhagen, the Danish uh, design standard. And that means that uh, there is a uh, pedestrian area and there's a curb a physical separation that also separates pedestrians from cyclists. And then we have the bike lane and then there's a curb that again physically separates the moving cars from the cyclist. And that physical barrier is key because if it's just a painted lane or something like that that you can cross, it doesn't give the same kind of uh, uh, yeah, a feeling of, of safety and security and also de facto safety and security. Is that a key thing for getting women actually onto bikes? Because that's very noticeable here. Yes. Research has shown that uh, the share of women cycling in a city is an indicator for how safe it is to cycle there. Women are generally more averse to risk in life than men. And when it comes to cycling, we simply won't cycle if it's not safe. I would say we're kind of smart that way. <laughs> um, and, and also, when you combine that with the fact that uh, women do 75 of the unpaid care work in the world, and that also means often uh, traveling with, with children, then you need it to be extra safe for you to, to travel uh, with your children. So designing for 
especially for women and also uh, for children to, to be able to, to cycle. That is designing, you know, with, with safety in mind. And then being, that's part of normalizing cycling and making it for a much broader group than the younger, more daring and, and strong and fearless. Tour de France uh, cyclists. Yeah. Although you're pretty um, good at that as well. Yeah. <laughs> It's a joined up transport strategy that makes cycling the obvious choice for commuters. There's a dedicated compartment for bikes, not just five places. You don't have to fight for it, it's not bookable, and it's on every commuter train. It's to die for. Leaving Copenhagen behind, I'm off to explore the rest of this island nation, heading for the small town of Skiva in the heart of Jutland. Denmark has roughly the same population as Scotland, but just half the landmass. It wasn't always this way. Denmark once controlled Norway, Sweden, Finland, Iceland and Schleswig-Holstein, lost to Germany in a disastrous war in 1864, after which Denmark almost ceased to exist. Yet the Danes rapidly adapted to this huge loss of territory, population and status without acrimony or nostalgia. Instead, the country accepted change and powered back, thanks in large part, to an education system that's quite unique. Take the next right onto Freelands Line. Well, uh, there is life beyond Copenhagen and the big cities. Uh, this is small town Denmark. It's very different though, it's quiet. There's no pub, there's no shop in this little village, but there are apparently six little groups and societies all funded by the council. So people are active citizens here, just not in the public realm. Larissa Albers is a teacher and mum. She walks her son, Felalik, to kindergarten every morning. Okay. They start the month before they turn three. Children start primary school not at four or five, but at six in Denmark. And kindergarten is a light touch start. They work with the letters and they work with the numbers and the colours, of course, but it's not a must that you can spell out your own name. Okay. It costs roughly a third of a full-time place in the UK. If you didn't have the kindergarten or any childcare, it would be very hard for you to be a teacher at all. Yes, exactly. I, I have about a 30-minute drive to my work and also 30 minutes back, so I need to go somewhere I can deliver my children and know they are safe and then I can do my job and provide money and provide for my family. Mm -hmm. you, you need to pick your child up before five mm -hmm. and that's fine. If you don't mind me asking, um, how much tax are you paying and are you happy to pay high tax for these facilities? Yes, I pay about 37% uh, of my income in taxes and I'm really happy and I'm glad I'm doing it because it means I got the kindergarten, I got hospitals and anything. I need provided. Is that the Danish way? Yes, we uh, all help each other so that everybody gets the possibility to go to kindergarten. You also have families who don't have that much money and then by us paying taxes we actually help them getting a cheaper or more discount in the daycare and some of them even go freely to daycare, they don't have to pay. Head teacher Marianne Christensen says the kindergarten encourages children to explore and learn the key skill of cooperation. We have activities that the, the grown-ups uh, are preparing for the, the children all day. Today is, we are really having a good weather, so we are outside. But we can go inside and cut and um, paint and play, and we all have all kinds of uh, toys inside. Yeah. Um, do, the, do any of the children have a difficulty with being outside? No, no, not at all. Yeah. It's mostly the, the parents that have their difficulties. They think they are um, hiding and we can't see them, or they're cold, they're wet, but that's not an, an issue at all. What do the children get from being outside all the time? Experience. They have to taste and uh, feel and yeah, yeah. And they're 
social activities uh, skills are very, very good because they have to move and get inside the play. Can I be with you or can I have not? And, and so they're learning to cooperate. Yeah, yeah. Because th this is the Danish way. Yeah. Uh, the Danish way is uh, that children playing is very valuable. Yeah. The kindergarten sets up play and cooperation in education, but that gets reinforced at the age of 15, when many youngsters spend a year away from home in a remarkable Danish invention, the Efterskola. They still do core academic subjects, but also learn something they truly love. This Efterskola specialises in diving, swimming and sailing. There's a holiday today, but normally 170 15-year-olds from all over Denmark are learning, living, cooking and diving together. Principal teacher Yannick Marshall says after school are about far more than just hitting academic grades. I think it's important that, that we take some of the, the pressure off, take some of the of the the, the, the tempo out of uh, getting uh, through to college and getting through to 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 our work. And I think that's too much. We have to stay right now in in in, in this age, 15, 16, and and look at each other, but also look inside and say, who am I? Uh, what do I want to do with my life? Um, I can see you living a different life from. The one I've lived, that's interesting. Tell me more. Um, so, so this this whole balance uh, as a as a begrip, um, that's 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 after school. Students share domestic chores, and for most of these 15-year-olds, it's their first time living away from home. And they sit in the dining room in the in the family. All oh, right. So it kind of makes it more manageable rather yeah. than being 170 yeah. people. Yeah. And yeah. then each family has a, a teacher. That's their mentor or closest relation to, mm -hmm. to home and home. And that's a very important role to be because life hurts sometimes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mm. The young people who come here are learning how to cooperate, create a community and become active citizens. I think we're, uh, we're happy, but we're also very self-focused. Um, and we try to use this year to show that now, now you're part of a, of a fellowship. Um, this is the strength of a fellowship. You give and you take. And some give more because they're wider shoulders right now or being a better place in life. And then you give more to, to, to the community uh, and then the, you get back. So you, there's ups and downs in life. Um, the ups and downs this year. Um, so I think that's, that's also the, one of the big values of being an unaided school. What's not to love? But the chance to explore your interests and yourself doesn't end with Efterskola at 15. Danes aged 18 to 99 can also attend folk high schools or folk co-schola. These residential learning centres, inspired by the Danish thinker Nikolai Grundvig, expand horizons, especially in that year between high school and university. Caroline Spielt Hoogsbro, the principal at Krabbesholm Hoogskola, explains that they recruit passionate practitioners, not conventional teaching staff. We're not allowed to do exams, exactly, and we're not allowed to give grades. So that is a very unique uh, possibility for us to teach in a way that nobody is controlling how we do it. Well, there is obviously some kind of control. We have to teach for some hours, uh, for a certain amount of hours, and it's not like there's no control with the schools at all, but it is the, um, a very clear claim of the school that we should not be a school with a curricul curriculum and no, no exams and no paper. If you ask people who in, in my age, they would say the year in the after school or the year in the high school was the best in my life. So that's something you take with you the rest of your life. Krabis Home is a modern arts-based school in a 500-year-old building with live-in teachers whose role is to encourage and inspire. 
teacher Kirsten Pals is here after an international career in visual arts. I'm not trained as a teacher, I, I am trained as a visual artist and I work as a visual artist and this is also something which is possible in this kind of school that uh, we can work here without being trained as teachers, but we come here through our knowledge and engagement and passion for the arts. I'm from Oslo, Norway, and I can already see a huge difference in how the education system is between the two countries, because here it's more for your own sake than doing something for your teacher. So you develop much more skills, and I feel like we're all very motivated to do mm. whatever we're doing in whatever studio or workshop because it's for your own sake and you learn so much more than just having a grade and a teacher coming in kind of saying oh no don't do that they kind of guide you I think it's quite normal in Denmark to do a high school uh, Men jeg klikkede ret meget på et tidspunkt, så det kan yeah, okay. yeah, det. Jeg er 21, og jeg var til at gå gymnasium, og jeg gjorde to gap år. Og jeg troede, at jeg try to do some art and arkitektur, så jeg fandt this skole. The students pay for half of the, the fee, and the Danish government believe very much in this kind of school. So they also subsidize high uh, school in Denmark because we believe that it, it's, a, it's a larger project uh, making um, good citizenships. So, so the, what, you, what you get with you in this half a year about living together, taking responsibility for each other, being a collective and um, orienting or like this personal also personal development has such a high value that the Danish government uh, have decided to to pay for this kind of school of course university still plays an important role in Danish education tuition is free and students often qualify for additional living support expenses it's part of flex security Another uniquely Danish take on the welfare state that accounts for more than a third of all government spending. Danes pay an average income tax of about 40%. So what do they get for their money? Free healthcare may sound like the average welfare state, but flexicurity is different. There are the small things, like parents get a day's pay to stay home with a sick child. And the big things, the Danish pension is truly livable, not one of the worst in the developed world. And unemployment benefit is linked to pay. That's the security part. But unusually, it's also relatively easy to get laid off in Denmark. And that's the flexibility bit. Here at Roskilde University, Professor Jonkvist is an expert in Denmark's welfare policies. We have a flexible labour market, so it's relatively easy for employers to sack people, and that's one of the reasons why we don't have zero uh, hour contracts. You know, people, employers can take in people if they need more uh, labour, and they can sack them if they don't need them. Because there's a high turnover, the economy works well, uh, but it's not born on the shoulders of the employers or of the unemployed. It's born on all of us, on the society collectively finance these unemployment benefits and all the measures that help, help people get back into work. So that's the contract we have, that you're not entitled to a specific job, but you're entitled to a job. And if you don't have a job, then you will get unemployment benefits and active labor market policies and other measures to, uh, trying to get you back into work. And that must be what partly makes Danes happy, yeah. the security. Yeah. Yeah, I've not thought about, about it that way before, but my friend, the painter, he loses his job two to four times a year, and he's a very happy man because he knows that he will get another job when he's fired, and he knows that in between the two jobs, he will get an unemployment benefit. So he's not uncertain about his income, and his financial institutions are not certain that he will pay his mortgage, so they're also happy to let him keep his house. So, where does the money come from? What fuels an economy that can finance such a generous welfare system? And go! 
Denmark is now a small country with relatively few natural resources. It's incredible to think that longships like these once crossed the oceans in the Viking era, striking terror into the hearts of people in Scotland, England and Ireland. But although the longships era has passed, the Danish domination of the world seas continues unabated. Maersk is one of the world's biggest shipping companies. And in the 70s, just as the Danish government had a hungry welfare system to feed, Maersk diversified into something new. Henning Morgan is the Maersk company historian. We also went into energy, energy production, formed a consortium called the Danish Underground Consortium, and uh, they produced the first Danish oil in 1972. Which is actually ahead of Norway and Scotland. Yes. So you're just quietly first. That developed into a company called Mask Oil. We developed into uh, contractors call, with a company called Mass Drilling, offshore services in mass supply service. So it got engaged in offshore and oil and gas production, which became a significant leg in the mass companies after 1972. It's ironic to be sitting in a country that's a leader in the green transition when you still got a lot of your business in oil. We, we did have a, a lot of our business in oil. We have uh, divested uh, basically all of our activities in production of oil and gas by now. Uh, and uh, as a reaction to the green transition, uh, mass supply service is still part of the AP Moller Group. Uh, but is moving away from offshore services to servicing the, the windmill industry. You pay taxes, and you paid taxes at a time when Denmark was really rolling out its welfare state. Yes, uh, in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, where we had the contract with the Danish state on the production of oil and gas, uh, we paid a lot of taxes, uh, and whether that paid for some of the welfare state, absolutely. Uh, our role today has probably been taken over by other companies because most of our activities, the mask activities, are around the world. No. This is the uh, office of Mr. A.P. Müller, so the founder of Mask. Right. Um, he died in 1965, and uh, at that time, the office was uh, put down and taken away and then re-established here as part of our museum. Your founder had some great sayings and one of them was, if you have the ability, you have the responsibility. So what does that mean? Let me start with the Danish phrase. It's called nyttig virksomhed, meaning having a positive impact on society. So if you look at uh, many of the sayings of A.P. Müller and his son, Mass McKinney Müller, you'll find this lying underneath what they're saying. We want to have a positive impact on society. And if we have the ability, we also actually have the responsibility to act on that ability. For a small country, Denmark has some huge corporations. Maersk is known all around the world, though it may not quite match Lego as a household name. That pioneering plastic toy launched in 1958. 400 billion pieces have been made since, and that's 50 bricks for everyone on the planet. And the wind industry wouldn't be the same without the innovation of Danish blacksmiths in the 1970s who created the company Vestas. Today, they produce a fifth of all the world's wind turbines on and offshore and sit at the forefront of Denmark's green international image. Danish turbines are powering an international energy revolution, but the underlying infrastructure needs to keep pace. That's where Danish colleges come in. Skiva College trains students from all over Europe in electricity distribution and subsea cabling. Head of Education Kurt Lindholm says they constantly adapt to the latest industry needs. Every year we have an adjustment of what is asked for in knowledge and competence. What are we going to produce of students and knowledge to fit the future? I would say about 80 to 90 percent of our students are somehow linked to the green transition and the future. So I'm from Hull, 
uh, Kingston upon Hull. Uh, the reason I'm here is uh, I'm a trainee for my uh, company called Swire Energy uh, Renewable Energy Services, and uh, we're here for a trainee to get qualified to a 66 kV training. We have people from Poland, Great Britain, Portugal on a uh, commercial training because the, the green transition is global and we provide some specific skills and some specific training that are, are needed around the world so they come here. We are a small country but we know we are good in engineering and we are good in, in acting, convert knowledge to action so we can sell our knowledge, we can sell our products. I think we have uh, realized we cannot, uh, we cannot only produce things or components, we also need to produce things that can be exported like knowledge. Well, we're leaving the mainland behind and heading to the tiny island of Samso. Normally people think that the big advances, the pioneers, the go-getters are all in cities, but this little island rather proves differently. They were the UN climate champions at the COP26 summit and they're likely to be net zero before the rest of Denmark and Europe. Nine miles off the Jutland coast, the island of Samso has less than 4,000 inhabitants and it's less than a third of Arran in size. It's a low-lying farming community and a popular holiday destination, not so different to many islands around Scotland. This metal is part of a system that pretty much no Scottish island has, which is a big subsea connector that takes all the surplus energy in Samso for sale on the mainland of Denmark. And that's exactly the opposite direction of travel that it used to be when the cable came in in 1960. Agriculture is at the heart of the island economy, with small farms producing cereal crops and vegetables. Typically Danish, they trust that the tourists will pay. In 1998, Samso Council won a Danish government competition to become a model community for the green transition. Now an energy academy is generating and passing on skills and knowledge. Its champion is a vegetable farmer turned energy guru, Soren Hermansen, who has the human nous needed to bring canny islanders on board, folk who wouldn't accept change simply for change's sake. The whole concept of being green is actually also, in my, my, my perspective, not what we aim to be. For us, I think it's kind of how to maintain a healthy society is maybe the most important reason for people to accept changes. If we can change things to the better, and the better is not for me to decide, it's not environment, it's not energy or wind turbines, but the wind turbines can be tools to achieve what you want to change or what, where you want to make a better quality of your life in a, in a social concept. And I think that is what we have kind of been sniffing around to find these connections, this glue of society where we can say, where does it make sense? And then wind turbines was one answer and using bio, uh, biomass instead of imported oil was another one. I mean, every time we had to evaluate it, does it, does it tick all the boxes? Is it cheaper? Is it better? Is it local? Does it produce jobs? Which was all the answers uh, that we had on the other side. I think that is basically kind of our recipe. And a lot of people ask, is there a model? Can we scale this? And it's, mm, I don't think so. It's not scalable, but it's, but it's inspirational. There's nothing new about wind power in Denmark, but getting the islanders to accept a new generation of towers in the landscape took careful negotiation. While farmers like Jorgen could see the money in wind, that didn't impress all of the neighbours. We get a licence here because we have a good air, air here. It's a long way to church, that's the point one. <laughs> oh, OK. So if, if there was a church here, that would be a problem? Maybe. No, it was hopeless. Oh. To avoid kind of the conflict between farmers and neighbors, we, we had a, an agreement with the farmers that they would let land, lease land to a co-op. 
and the cobalt was already existing and they could then have two turbines or we didn't know how many but we asked people to sign up and, and show up and say I'd like to buy a share in a wind turbine not to silence them but to give them an opportunity to be co-owners because the co-ownership makes people much more aware of why it's, it's there well because it's money in the pocket for one reason but it's also like you are part of a process where you are involved in it both physically and mentally that you, we are doing this not just a few farmers and so in two weeks there was 50 farmers that asked for wind turbines on the countryside why because it was terrible good business everybody could see we could pay it back in uh, six seven years and once islanders shared the benefits few begrudged jorgen his new wind-based business empire I have the farming and the energy and now we have uh, built uh, 20 flat for older people. So now I, I have uh, three legs. Three legs, right. Yeah. Okay, not just one farming leg. Yeah. You have a farming leg, an energy leg and a building leg. Yeah. Right, that's quite a lot of legs. Soren's plan also included making the island's villages and towns more energy efficient. They had largely relied on imports of oil, but their own fields were brimming with another potential fuel, and there was a looming energy crisis. So then we talked and negotiated with the farmers. They knew what the oil prices were, and we said to them, can you provide a 20% cheaper price with straw? Then I think we can convince most people to connect to district heating, because it, this will mean their energy bill will be cheaper per year. So there's a win-win for everybody. The, the house owners will have cheaper heat, the farmers will make a living or make, a, make a, an income from straw where they usually just had to compost it on the field. And we'll produce a number of jobs we didn't have before to dig down the trenches for piping, connecting the houses, taking the oil furnaces out and putting in heat pumps and so on and so forth. So, so, so when we talked about it in that way, we gave kind of a lot of different reasons for people to connect to this and say, yes, this is exactly what we're wishing for. You also killed a lot of birds with one stone because when you had the pavements up, you put a lot of stuff down there in, in one go. I mean, <clears throat> when, when, when we're looking at change, a lot of people say, but we also have this problem and that problem and this problem. And then, then we can get stuck in, in a number of problems that piles up. Instead, we try to reverse that and think, to them, how many problems can we solve in one go? So when we do open up the road, then we could talk to the water people and say, what about these old rusty steel pipes? Maybe it's time to change them. All right, that's fine. We'll pay our bit. The electricity people, why don't we take these hanging wires down that every now and again there's a storm or ice or, or they, they also corrode and they fall down and maintenance costs are higher and higher. Put them in the ground in cables and it could be broadband, it could be many different things here. So we talked to everybody and made them commit to this and co-finance the, the installations. So that made everything cheaper. So you are 3,700 people yeah. with one council here. Yeah. Yeah. And that really works. You, you would be, in Scotland, there is nothing that small, no. so everything's I mean, huge. Sometimes people always say, oh, it would, it would be much, much better if we're in a, in a bigger municipality because there's also a lot of little things that becomes big problems because we are a small place. But I think in the long run, it, it has a lot of uh, advantages to be a small place where we can actually communicate directly. But I mean, everything has a, has a, has a flip side, but, but, but I think that's true, it is better. Um, to make decisions in a, in a, in a smaller environment where you, where, where you know who to talk to. That very local decision made Jorgen a happy farmer. Islanders too. 80% now have district heating and their bills were cut during the cost of living crisis when UK bills trebled. Samso has four district heating boiler plants. Bales from local farms are loaded on a slow conveyor belt that inches the straw into a high efficiency burner. The furnace heats water and the water is piped in the streets to heat local homes with ash returned to the fields. In here I see a whole lot of straw bales that's kind of like a bit of a straw shed. You see on the other hand. This is not just the hay barn. <laughs> This, this is a bank uh, deposit uh, for energy. 
The great thing about this is that all your materials basically are so local. I mean, this facility has contracts with five, six farmers who are not more than three to five kilometers away from this facility. And we have the same with the other facilities also. So we don't spend kind of the saved carbon emission in transporting long distances and big trucks and tractors driving uh, on the roads for long distances. And then the other thing is, if anything goes wrong, the machinery is simple enough that a local person can fix it. This is not high tech. So yes, we can call the plumber and he'll come and fix almost everything here uh, with his own tools and his own capacity. The only variable factor is weather. Late season rain has delayed the harvest this year. So as I leave Samso, the farmers are still in the fields. It's clear that going green has brought jobs, security and cheaper energy and that's made the whole community very happy. Back in Copenhagen, I'm heading to the heart of Danish democracy. How have these progressive policies survived the coming and going of governments over 50 years? The TV series Borgen brought Denmark's coalition politics into living rooms across the world with its female prime minister hatching deals in these very cloisters. And that's because Denmark's proportional parliament demands negotiation. Unlike the Westminster system with its first past the post and winner takes all. If we don't have a concrete help, he's going to hold himself. So look, there's blood. It gives me no integration, no matter what. De får finansjustitia, udenrigsminister og seks andre, så tager vi økonomi og erhverv, undervisning og kultur. Borgen's dramatic film location is nowhere near the actual seat of government. That business is conducted across the river in less striking, if more practical, modern settings, like the foreign ministry. Dan Jorgensen is the minister for climate, energy and utilities. Most people would have watched Borgen and thought that OK, that's brilliant, it's impressive, but it's a drama. It is actually for real because your parliament, your governments, are invariably coalitions between many parties, and that's normal because you've got a proportional parliament. Well, not only are they coalitions, very often they will also be minority governments. So you'll be in governments, but you won't actually have the majority uh, yourself. You, you're dependent on other parties to support you. And this makes it almost impossible for political parties to just go strictly for their own agenda. Also, um, very often, even if you have a majority, for instance, right now we have a majority government, we don't actually use that uh, majority very often. Uh, we almost always seek to have other parties uh, on board for several reasons. One is, okay, so if power changes, we are pretty sure that the decisions that we've made will stand. That's an important reason. But also, actually, it's a part of Danish culture, that political culture, that uh, broad majorities and broad compromises are seen as a good in itself. Now, if you ask most Danish people, they would probably tell you that they think that we have a lot of political differences in Denmark, but which we also do on, 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 on some issues. But, but if you compare it to almost all other countries, the things that we are arguing about in the Danish parliament are quite small differences. So, for instance, we have this tax-funded welfare state, and there's actually no parties in the Danish parliament that wants to fundamentally change that. I must say, in the time that we've been here, we can really see that just in every sort of small way, people are very relaxed, it's very consensual, there's not much conflict about. Well, this is also something that you can see in the United Nations uh, Happiness Index. We are almost always on top of that, that index. And I think, again, obviously for idealistic reasons, you want your people of a country to be happy. But also for rational reasons, I mean, a happy country is a country that's less sick, that's more productive, that's got less conflict. There's so many positive things to say about that. And of course, it's all a circle because if you're not happy and you don't have a lot of trust, 
social capital in society, then you're not able or willing to pay that much in tax. And if you don't pay that much in tax, you're not able to uh, have this welfare state. And then, so you see, it's all interconnected. In the 1970s, a big decision happened when the oil crisis happened, the OPEC crisis happened, all the oil and gas prices in the world went up. But Denmark did something really quite extraordinary afterwards, which was... Well, we decided that it wasn't a good idea to be dependent on energy sources from other countries. So basically, uh, instead of being dependent on, uh, on oil uh, from uh, countries that could, like this, uh, decide to raise the prices and thereby hurt our economy, we needed alternatives. And that's actually how we started developing uh, renewable energy. So at that time, strange to think about it now, but at that time it didn't really have anything to do with the environment. Uh, it wasn't a green movement as such. It then quickly evolved to that because uh, many of the very active forces in the Danish society that wanted to make this happen were also interested in the environment. So it went hand in hand, but actually that's how it started. So really it was about protecting your independence as a country, really? Yeah, it was. Instead of buying your energy very expensive, from other countries and thereby also being dependent on them, it was much better to create your own energy. But then you also decided to keep the price of oil and gas high in Denmark and you made the cost of importing cars really, really expensive. Yes. Who votes for parties like that? <laughs> well, we decided uh, decades ago that maybe it's a good idea uh, if you want a welfare state that, ex that is expensive, so you need a lot of tax revenue. Maybe it's then a good idea to tax the things that's a good idea to tax because you also want to limit it. Uh, because then you'd get two things. You'll get the revenue from the taxes, but you will also get less pollution. Uh, having said that, I, I would lie if I said that it's very popular to tax uh, cars. Uh, it isn't. But on the other hand, uh, I think most people in Denmark sort of just accept it because they know, one, we need to do it because of the environment and the climate. And two, if we didn't tax that, if we didn't tax the cars, we would need the money from somewhere else and we would have to tax something different. Coming back to the question of climate, Denmark is, still, is now right at the front of the green transition, having created the grouping beyond oil and gas at the COP26 summit actually in Glasgow. Um, what are your immediate aims and how confident are you you're going to get there? Well, we've decided to stop our oil and gas uh, production. When we made the decision, we were the biggest oil producer in the EU. So, so we did, even though we also uh, had a lot of renewables already uh, then, uh, we still also had oil and gas. And we still do have oil and gas today. But we decided that if we want to fight climate change, it's not enough to be leading in renewable energy. So that's really the demand side of, of, um, of the energy uh, question. We also needed to be leaders on the supply side. So it would have been a bit of a paradox if in the future we would be 100% green in Denmark, but we, we would still withdraw oil and gas and sell it to others. Mm. So we would just export the problem. That, that would not be a good idea. So we decided to stop all um, future licensing rounds and put an end date in 2050. Now for this to, to actually happen, which it will, uh, of course we then need alternatives. So this means that we also had to spark and our innovation and be even more ambitious on, uh, on renewables. And that is what we're doing. But life's not perfect. Denmark's refugee policy has international critics. Its proportional parliament means far-right parties are represented and very visible. And a controversial new law limits the proportion of non-Western people in certain neighbourhoods to aid integration. But though Denmark has many of the same problems facing Britain, it tends to approach them with an instinctive solidarity. Oli Dahl is a regional newspaper editor and was a political correspondent in Copenhagen. The age for when you can leave your job is, is going up because we want people to stay a little longer working. So retirement age. Retirement age, yes, yeah, that's going up slightly uh, all the time actually. 
67 now, but it will go up to maybe 69 in a, in a couple of years. So, so uh, but we accept that we have to maybe be hardworking to have the money for the, the, the welfare system, the, the social system we have to make sure that everyone has uh, the possibility of a, of, a, of a good life. The biggest problem is now to have enough people uh, uh, to fill out the, 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 the jobs which is not occupied at the moment, meaning both the welfare system and the education system and the private companies could use a lot more staff at the moment, many, many places also here locally. So we just hope for, for uh, except, uh, for instance, the Ukrainians have very easy, refugees from Ukraine have very easily found job here and we're happy about that. Uh, but we also need, you know, the young people when they finish school, uh, more of them to stay in this area instead of moving to Copenhagen, uh, for instance. We need them here to, to fulfill the, the job uh, applies that are here. Issues you might find in any Scottish paper. In fact, Ola is a regular visitor to Scotland and sees strong similarities with Denmark. In many ways, you know, Scotland and Nordic countries are so similar, I think, when it comes to life and priorities in life, that I hope also uh, that this cooperation could even be stronger between Scotland especially and the Nordic countries. Denmark is now a small but perfectly formed country. The astonishing thing about the Nordic countries is that there are so many small countries working together, but nobody seems to think you should all have the same currency. Mm -hmm. All of you have a different currency from each from the neighbour, mm -hmm. and you're not a United States of Scandinavia, no. and you you never will be, will no. you? One one state? No, no, never. No, never. no, no, no. We like to have this uh, independence as we have the, the the Scandinavian countries, and, and it works very well. We cooperate and uh, we let the, the people and the countries flourish in their own way and, and in a way which, where they have their strengths, they can show it and still have a, a good strong cooperation because that's needed of course when, when we have a challenge in the world. Europe should stick together as far as I can see it and the Nordic countries and maybe also Scotland could, could be part of, of that cooperation to, to you know, stick together and work together and Scotland, of course, we'd like to see uh, Scotland back in Europe someday. I've got one more trip in my journey of discovery. I'm travelling east from Copenhagen to test the ease of movement between Denmark and her nearest foreign neighbour, Sweden. Very easy, as it turns out. The famous Orison Bridge between Denmark and Sweden, a frictionless border between two different countries with different systems, different languages and different currencies. Does that get in the way of cross-border trade? Not when you pay by card. Uh, which country are we in? Sweden. Yeah, just so close to Denmark and no bother. <coughs> Paying here? Yeah. Do you want to receive? Tap. Just like that. So this is Denmark. It's known for its green energy and happy people. But its biggest achievement threaded through my journey and across the lifespan of every Dane is cooperation. It's built into the kindergarten and unique Efterskola, the district heating that powers communities, and the coalition parliament that can stick to an anti-oil strategy for 50 years. You can ski on heating systems, swim in docks, and escape your parents at 15, all courtesy of the state. Denmark is relaxed, cooperative, and playful, without the stress that bedevils adversarial Britain. Happiness, like beauty, is more than skin deep. No wonder the Danes are laughing. <laughs>